Hi all. I think this may be the 10th or the 15th take of this particular video post. I can't seem to get through it without coughing my head off or tripping over my own words. I've been sick. I've had a bad cold or a flu bug or something, and the result is that my voice is in the cellar. I am now able to reach bass notes that I've never reached before in my life. But it makes me hard to understand, I hear, so I'll try to speak in a way that you can understand what I'm saying. I hope you're feeling well today. Anyway, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 10. As you know from your own reading, this chapter begins with a satire on idolatry. And these verses are significant even for us who may not worship foreign gods. They are significant because they set the Lord apart from every other object of worship. Our God, there is no one like Him, verses 6 and 7. He is the true and living God, the eternal King, verse 10. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth, verse 12. He is the controller of the clouds and the rain, verse 13. And He claims Israel as His very own, verse 16. What this passage tells us is what is found all through the Old Testament, the idea of the incomparability of the Lord. He is the incomparable one. There is no one like Him, and He is our God. Now, as the passage comes to a close, the chapter, that is, Jeremiah is expressing his own grief at the fall of his people. He's also reflecting on the stupidity of Judah's rulers, her shepherds, who brought this calamity to pass. This is in a section where he is lamenting the fall of Judah. And in verse 23, we find an interesting passage, and I expressed earlier that it's one that may be familiar to a lot of us. It's one that I remember hearing a lot in my growing up years. Uh, the passage is, I know, O Lord, that the way of human beings is not in their control, that mortals, as they walk, cannot direct their steps. That even sounds a little unfamiliar to me because I memorized that verse in the King James Version. But I know you've heard that before. Now, in the context, what is Jeremiah doing? He is proposing an argument that he hopes will convince God not to to put the hammer down on his people. You see, Jeremiah loves his people, and so he's pleading with them, no, he's pleading with God for them to the very end. And his argument, perhaps, is that a person's course is not in his or her own control, nor is he able to direct his steps. Lord, how responsible are we for the direction that we are now going. Is that what Jeremiah is seeming to say in that verse? Well, I think there are a couple of interpretations that are possible, and I want you to think about these. Here is one. Could it be that Jeremiah is referring to a fundamental moral weakness in human beings, which makes us unable to resist evil consistently and walk uprightly all of our days? Well, I have a hard time with that interpretation, although I guess it might be possible because I don't believe in the sinful nature. I know God gave us flesh and spirit, but He did not make us sinful. He did not make us, uh, He did not give us an inherent sinful nature. We choose to sin, we choose to disregard His law. So I, 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 I would rather don't believe that that's what Jeremiah is saying, but I guess it's a possibility. Here's another possibility of the interpretation of verse 23. This could be a reference to the destiny of human beings, which is outside their control, however much we may imagine in our pride that it lies within our own power. Our destiny is really not up to us. Now, bear with me here and think this through. Perhaps Jeremiah is saying, all right, God intends to punish Israel. God intends to punish Judah for their sin. And if this is God's intention, well, God's intention will come to pass. After all, our destiny is outside of our control. Of course, when I think about that, I wonder just how much control I really have anyway. 
And I'm not a fatalist. Are you? I don't believe that we are uh, at the mercy of fate. That whatever uh, will happen, will happen. I don't believe that. But I, I do think what Jeremiah might be saying is, Lord, we've sinned and you must punish us and you are the potter and we are the clay. And this is something that certainly lies outside of our control. However we're going to interpret verse 23, I think we can say that what Jeremiah is doing here is pleading for God's mercy. Please, Lord, have mercy on your people. If I were to apply that verse, and I'm all for application, as you know, I think I would say that God's going to have his way. And it doesn't make any sense at all to fight God. I mean, we've got to align ourselves with God and his purposes for our lives and his will for our lives. There's no sense in fighting him because God is going to have his way. At any rate, this is a plea for God's mercy. Well, I'd be interested to hear what you think about verse 23. I think that's interesting. And also it's interesting that Jeremiah still has a love for these people even as he's lowering the boom on them. He cares about them. He doesn't want to see them be punished. He doesn't want to see them destroyed. These are his people, after all. Okay, let's go to chapter 11. Preview it. First of all, you're going to find more warnings in this chapter. Judah has broken covenant with God, and the call in chapter 11 is obey God's voice. Again and again and again, we come across that word and the importance of obeying God's voice. And beginning in verse 18... We learn of a plot against Jeremiah's life. Now that's going to be interesting. And how are we going to apply that to our own lives? What prayers will that text generate? I'm looking forward to reading your prayers. As Jeremiah's own countrymen conspire to put him to death because of what he's preaching. Mm, a rich passage. Thanks for listening and thanks for viewing and I'll see you in a few days. God bless.